give you the basic facts about uh, Lorraine that most of you know because it's traditional and then maybe add a few things. Uh, she holds an, uh, an MA in counseling psychology and MFA, creative writing, you know that. And you know there's short stories and poems and essays have been published all over the place, including the New York Times, uh, she won the Barbara Denning, Deming Award early in her career for her nonfiction work, and her she's been also nominated for a Pushcart Prize. And I'm looking forward to seeing on her resume soon that she has had a Pushcart Prize and maybe more. So we're, we we know that's going to happen. Her books, uh, Lost Fathers, that. Writing Begins with the Breath, The Writing Warrior, wonderful books. Um, and then I've been trying all day to say Gethsemane better. Gethsemane. Yes, I know. I, I practiced <laughs> it. I've never in my life. So you did that as a test for in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, I know you did. So <laughs> and I failed. Um, Gathering Lights and Go Swamp Blues. I, I now have the grief force seems to me to stand apart, just like you stand apart from all that, uh, those facts about yourself as being such a vivacious and talented classroom teacher. And, and so you, you find such unique and creative solutions to all kinds of problems and opportunities that come up. So that isn't in your bio, but it should be. And also, This Grief Forest is such a precious book. Uh, the whole idea, and now we live in a world of grief. I mean, there's always been grief. And I want to hear, you know, when you decided to write that book, because it is the perfect book for our times. You know, it helps you with, not only with the grief, but understanding how you can make the grief a good thing and not something that weighs you down. So I'm gonna shut up now and let uh, Lorraine take over and uh, be ready with questions uh, because I have some and uh, I'm sure you will too. So Lorraine, show's all yours. Thank you, Susan. That's very kind. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen here in a minute. Um, all throughout the talk, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Susan's going to be monitoring those. I'm going to close the chat out on my end while I'm talking because I get end up looking at it and following the pinging and I get distracted and, and all that. So, But feel free if something comes up that you want to ask, she'll be looking for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about kind of how I came to this particular book and this work, read a really small part of it. It's a very short, um, short part, and then talk a little bit about ways to work with grief and then open it up for questions um, at the end. Um, and I feel like I've been on Zooms for a year now, so maybe this will work as it's supposed to work. If anything else, don't you think Zoom has taught you patience? <laughs> I feel like it's taught me a lot of patience. Can you see? Can someone who, yeah, okay. Okay. So the first thing I do wanna do is have you all, um, if you feel compelled to type into the chat, um, your thoughts on one or more of these questions. Um, when you hear the word grief, what are your first reactions and thoughts? Um, where does grief tend to settle in your body? And what are some unhelpful things you heard from well-meaning people when you were grieving? Um, and so I'd like to take just a minute or two and if you have um, thoughts on that to, to hear what you have to say. And I am gonna look at this chat as you're typing. So please go ahead and, and uh, let me know where you're coming from.
Y'all are Zoom pros. Everyone's a Zoom pro now. <laughs> so we have some things like, you know, grief equals death. It makes a cannonball hole in my heart. Grief equals a loss of longing, a hollowness in my stomach. Um, I think these are some things people have said that were, that were not helpful. Just get over it, be strong, ignore it. Um, first thought, grief is messy, personal, without a timeline. Um, when I hear the word grief, the first reaction is welcome it in. Um, it settles in my chest, on my shoulders. It feels heavy, anxiety inducing, a feeling uh, in my core and pit of my stomach. Grief settles in my throat. Um, unhelpful things, at least she's in a better place now. At least she's not suffering any longer. Um, neck and head for grief pain, a, a death stab in the gut. Um, grief is a mourning that gets lodged deep within your soul. Uh, you'll get over it. Mm -hmm. Unhelpful time will heal grief. You will get over it. Um, and I, I don't know if you saw Kim, my jaw dropped when I read this the first time. A counselor told her to read the four agreements when she was in the darkest part of her grief. And I don't even have anything to say about that. I, it, yeah, I hope you left that counselor. I, <laughs> um, grief ties my uh, shoulders, neck into knots, loss. My grief goes into my tummy. Um, well-meaning, not helpful. Yes, he, she, they had a grand life. He or she's in a better place now. Um, when I called someone to say my 53-year-old father had just drowned, the person said, oh, I have to go dry my hair or I will be late for breakfast. Oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, unhelpful, look on the bright side. Um, you'll feel better soon. <laughs> not. Um, grief settles in my shoulders. Um, I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah, feels by rote. Um, unhelpful grief is only for death. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh, was he or she sick? Ouch. Yeah. Um, book recommendations, not helpful. <laughs> and here I am talking about a book. Um, some, some unhelpful things heard a Buddhist person pointing out the pitfalls of him. Love that weaponized Buddhism, the pitfalls of impermanence and attachment. Um, uh, what a taboo word subject. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you all. Um, on my end, I'm gonna just close the chat out so I don't get distracted. Um, grief is a very physical experience. It's, it's at one level, um, it's a stress response. Um, and so it does move through the body like a stress response does. Um, but of course it also brings with it psychological and emotional components to that. Um, as well. And grief is not, as one of you pointed out in the chat, it's not just about a death. Um, you can look at grief as um, the emotional and physiological responses that come up whenever there is a change of any kind. So even if it's something that's supposed to be, you know, a, a happy occasion, like a graduation or a marriage or, or something like that, there is still a leaving behind of the life that you had before and some of the familiar things that you had before. Um, even if you're making a choice consciously to move forward into a next, you know, in the next part of your life, there's still a grief that occurs when we make these kinds of changes. Um, this guy, Gary Andrews, and if any of y'all are on Twitter, um, you might like to follow his account. Um, his, he's a professional illustrator and his wife died in 2017 and he started to do in the beginning a doodle a day to kind of work through his grief. Um, and I happened to have found this Twitter account in 2017, which was the year that I was diagnosed with cancer. So I was particularly looking for like other people who were experiencing things that wanted to talk for real about it that didn't want to do all of those kinds of platitudes that, that you guys have written in the chat as well. Um, and so this example, and again, I know if you're on a small screen, you might not be able to read what he wrote. Um, he said, three years ago today that you died. And yet still, every time the cat pushes open the door, I look up to where I would see your face. And just for a split second, I hope, maybe it's all been a bad dream. The habit of your presence persists. And if you can't quite see the illustration, there's a cat that's clearly alive and then a kind of a ghostly image of his wife um, kind of coming through the door. Um, and, and that his account kind of got in my, in my body. And, and I really would look forward to seeing how he was, was representing his feelings you know, through art. Um, my, this is me and my dad in 1971, um, give or take. Um, my dad died when I was 19 in 1987, and um, he had had a 
major heart attack in uh, 1976 when he was 36 years old and I was eight. And um, after that point, he really couldn't um, work anymore. He, he wasn't totally homebound, but he was, he was mostly homebound and everything, you know, everything changed for us. Um, my family is um, an everything is fine family. So um, the way that we worked with this was to pretend that it wasn't happening. And um, my mom um, is the child of alcoholics. And so she wanted very much for our life, our childhood, I mean, my sister's childhood to be better than hers. And one of the ways that she tried to, to do that was to protect us from things that she thought would be upsetting to us. Um, and of course, one of the, the impacts of that was, you know, seeing something going on in front of me and then being told it wasn't going on in front of me is gaslighting. And it, it does make you start to question the reality of, of your own and the validity, you know, of your own experience. Um, it's been, this year it'll be 34 years since he died. And, um, you know, we still have not, the three of us as a family ever had a conversation about it. We've never visited the grave together with the exception of the day that he was buried. Um, I've had little side conversations with my sister and with my mom from time to time, but um, you know, if there was ever a recipe to turn me into a grief therapist, it, this was it. Um, and um, already being a writer and knowing that that was a real significant part of the way that I saw the world, um, this, um, this really shaped kind of what came next. Um, I had no idea what to do when he died. I, you know, completely, I made a series of what we might call poor choices. And um, those poor choices had um, really kind of decades long ramifications, um, uh, some of them financial, you know, some of them physical. Um, these are just a couple of the, the last family, you know, photos that we, you know, that we had. Um, but the reason I showed you those first is because this one here is two years after he died. Um, and I know a lot of you know me in real life. Um, this is obviously me on the, in the orange shirt. Um, right after he died, I lost 75 pounds in about 16 months. Um, and I dropped to a size two. There was even a brief window of time when I was actually a size zero. Um, I do not think that I was born a size zero. I mean, I think I was, you know, I was already, you know, a, a, a woman of flesh. And uh, what really struck me, especially when I look back on this, is that the only feedback I ever got about this was how great I looked and how good I was doing. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a conscious decision to stop eating. Um, and I did eat, I ate peanut M&Ms. Um, so you, you can live on that, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting diet choice, but you, you can do it. Um, but the feedback was so overwhelmingly positive. Um, and it wasn't until I could see photographs almost side by side where it was like, dang, did no one think that maybe that was strange when I had never had a body type like that, you know, ever, even in, you know, early adolescence, any, you know, ever like that. And um, so when I started to look at studying grief, which I did when I went back for my second master's, um, one of the things that, that we learned was how important it is to look at uh, changes in people's familiar patterns of behavior. So um, if I had, after my dad died, ended up shooting heroin, I feel reasonably sure my mom would have said something, you know, and that people would have reached out or would have, you know, um, cause that was not any type of behavior that I had ever engaged in before. If I had ended up drinking too much, if I had ended up, you know, um, starting a crime spree, you know, something like, like that, you know, but something that's viewed as, um, as positive in our culture, which is thinness was something that, you know, if it was noticed, was noticed in only a, you know, kind of a positive way, but it was such a substantial change in my current, you know, in my way of, of moving in the world um, that I always wanna bring it up to help other people see in their own grieving experiences. And if they're supporting other people in their grief experiences, look for what's starting to change and start to, you know, um, you know, it's not always a moment for an intervention or anything like that, but just start to notice and pay attention and see how you might be able to support someone because we send out a whole lot of signals that are not verbal. 
and um, you know the friends that are able, the friends and family that are able to see and acknowledge those changes and sit and stay with the person who is grieving are the friends that are going to make it, you know, kind of all the way, you know, through that process. So I started working on this book um, right after we shut down. And, and uh, those of you who aren't in Arizona, we basically shut down in March, but we never really have shut down because personal freedom or whatever. Um, but we're <laughs> mostly shut down. My school closed down and I've been working from home since then. Um, and I really couldn't write. I couldn't put sentences together. And so I started to doodle. I had all the, all the art in the book was done on an iPad. And I learned how to, oh, I shouldn't even say I learned, I never have actually learned how to draw. I drew a lot as a kid and I loved it as a kid. And then you know how you, you learn that you're better at one thing than another thing. And then you can tend to leave the thing well, I'm not, there are people who are way better illustrators than me. So we'll let them do that. And I'll focus on writing or I'll focus on this, or I'll focus on that. And you know, you kind of end up existing in a, um, in a binary, you know, almost. And I found the art to be really soothing. And that was a surprise to me. And I started posting the pictures of what I was working on on Facebook. And um, I'm not a natural social media person. I don't ever feel like I quite know what to say. And you know, as an author, there's all this pressure to build a platform and engage with readers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's hard for me because I value actual connection and conversation and I'm not really good. Even, you know, if we were in a room together, I'm not good at small talk. I want to like jump in, like, tell me your grief story. <laughs> you know, I don't want to stay at the, at the surface, which is, which clears a room pretty quick. So, um, but I started putting these animals up and some of you who are on this call are some of the people who responded to the images. Um, and so I feel like the animals began to be almost co-created with the people I was engaging with on Facebook. I took a lot of feedback from people um, on what was working and what was resonating. And I think the biggest surprise was that they resonated at all because I had the voice in my head that like, I'm not an illustrator. And so why are these animals doing anything for anybody? So then my agent called and she's like, Lorraine, you have a book. And I'm like, I don't have a book. I'm not an illustrator. And um, she said, I, you know, you do because they're making me cry. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you just cried everything. And so we had this kind of, you know, this kind of conversation around that. And so I really then started to think about like, what could it be a book? What kind of, what do I want to tell? What kind of story do I want to tell? And how do I want to tell it? And um, so if you're familiar at all with grief theory, the, um, the term bereavement. So we have grieving, mourning, and bereavement are kind of the three anchor terms. Um, grief is your internal response to the loss. Mourning is your external behaviors. So that might be crying or snapping at somebody or eating only peanut M&Ms or, you know, that, that type of thing. And then um, I just feel like I should, they're still there. I eat more than that now, but they're still there. Um, so more uh, bereavement is the noun. So mourning and grieving can, you know, can be verbs, but, but bereavement is a space. It's like a liminal space that you enter into as a griever. And I wanted to think about what kind of metaphor might work for, um, for grief. And so I, I then thought about a forest. So the way the book is, um, the, the premise of the book, um, our main character, Bunny, over here, she's she's just a hot mess. She's um, really, really trapped in her grief. You can see she's hiding um, here in these little pipe cleaner vines that, um, that I drew. Um, every character has balloons, and the balloons are the, the visual metaphors for the character's grief that they're going through. And then death serves as her guide through the forest. Um, so the next part, I'm just going to read about the first, you know, 20 pages, and then it's just like a line a page, so that doesn't sound as horrible as it might have just sounded to you. It's very fast. When Bunny's daddy died, she captured her grief in a bubble, the color of his soul. Bunny fell into a whirl of emotions and was swept away. She arrived at the grief forest holding her grief tight. Welcome to the grief forest, crowed Raven. 
Bunny noticed Raven had other griefs in his beak and wondered what they meant, but she was too afraid to ask, and she was too afraid that Raven would take hers away, so she hid and held it even tighter. Grandmother Bunny came to meet her at the edge of the forest. It's okay, Bunny, she said. I will help you. Why is there a fire, asked Bunny. She worried about the trees burning down and feeling pain. That's a ritual fire, said Grandmother Bunny. It's our sacred duty to keep it going. It helps honor our ancestors and keeps the connection strong between this world and the next. Bunny gripped her grief. She didn't want it to go in the fire and get burned up. See that, said Grandmother Bunny. That's Ouroboros and he protects the grief forest. The Ouroboros symbolizes the cyclical nature of the universe. And he reminds us that life is born from death. Bunny's eyes grew wide watching Ouroboros eating his own tail, but she had to look away so she could focus on her own grief. It was getting very heavy and making her tired. But Bunny couldn't rest because she promised she would never put her grief down. It was her special chosen friend to remind her of daddy. Sometimes she even talked to her grief. That made her feel less lonely and she could pretend she was talking to her father. They arrived at a circle in the forest where many bunnies waited with their own griefs. Let's join them, said Grandmother Bunny. They've been waiting for us. Bunny trembled. Don't be afraid, said Grandmother Bunny, but Bunny couldn't help it. There was so much grief in the circle, she didn't know how she would breathe. So she ran away and came face to face with death, holding its own grief on a string. Bunny waited for death to speak, but it didn't. Death held up a lantern and Bunny decided to follow the light, even though it took her away from Grandmother Bunny and deeper into the forest. Ghosts were everywhere. Bunny realized every ghost carried a different color of grief. Were there other kinds of grief besides hers? Hers was so big, it felt like the only one in the world, but maybe others had experienced grief too. Her curiosity was almost bigger than her fear. Almost, but not quite. Follow me, said Death. Death summoned Bunny's grief toward it and Bunny had to follow quickly so she didn't lose track of it. Are you ready to meet grief, asked Death. Bunny thought she had met grief. She carried it with her everywhere she went. Carrying a thing and understanding a thing are not the same, said Death. Many creatures think this and that confusion makes living hard. Bunny was surprised that Death had compassion for others. That went against the story she had been told about the meaning of death. If you want to know grief secrets, you have to follow me, said Death, but I'm going into the cave whether you are with me or not. Grandmother Bunny had stayed with the other bunnies in the grief circle. Bunny waved to her, but she was busy reading from a big book. Bunny didn't want to walk with Death, but she also didn't want to be alone with her grief. So she gathered up her courage and entered the cave. The first creatures she met were two startled kittens. Grief catches you by surprise sometimes, said Death. Before you know it, you can float away and get lost. Bunny could relate to that. When she first got her grief, it had a mind of its own and all she could do was hold on. Shh, said Death. Solitary cat watched the falling leaves. She was so still. What is she doing, asked Bunny. She's not doing at all, said Death. She is being. Bunny didn't understand what that meant and Death didn't say anything else. Bunny thought she was supposed to do things all the time in order to be a good bunny. She had been doing a lot when her daddy died and her grief found her. But soon after, she started to do even more because it was what she knew. She was also sure that if she stopped moving, she would have died too. The next creature looked so strange. What's wrong with them, asked Bunny. Nothing at all, said Death. Ask them what's happening. The creature laughed nervously, but said, I feel like nothing fits. I'm in so many different skins. Grief breaks you apart, said Death. And it is scary sometimes when you're in between who you were and who you're becoming. So that's kind of the start of the book. Throughout the, the book, Bunny meets uh, different animals who are in you know, different stages of um, complication in their grieving process. Um, what I really wanted to be able to do was, I wanted to distill um, 25 years of, of working with grief, um, both personally and clinically and professionally, almost into a 
visual haiku. Um, you know, I certainly realized that the text was not a haiku, but I wanted to like, how can I really condense everything that I, that I think would be helpful in a way that can be received? Um, you know, the person who put in the comments that, you know, book recommendations are not helpful. This book was actually in part a response to that. <laughs> because so here's a book to help with why books aren't important but I think um, there are times in our lives when books are not necessarily useful and some of the books that people can hand out to you are books that really are for when you're a lot farther along in the process than when you're right at the start um, like I know when I you know when I was going through cancer the last thing I wanted to read about were um, you know all of the 18 million different ways I could be addressing my cancer. Um, I didn't need any more voices in my head about what to do. I needed to find a way to hear my own voice about what to do. Um, and so the books that I did seek out about cancer when I was going through it, in the immediacy of going through it, were people who were walking it with me. And um, I have on the, on the Grief Forest website, I have a list of books that I found to be useful. Um, but a lot of them are theoretical or are, you know, more, you know, help manuals or, um, you know, things that, that would hit you better later. And I wanted Bunny and I had hoped because it was illustrated, um, I wanted it to be a book that could witness the griever where they were and not talk down to the griever, not provide, you know, here are 10 help, make sure you get enough sleep. Well, that's useful. You know, I <laughs> drink a lot of water, you know, and all of that, it's, all of that matters, you know, but it's, it's not necessarily useful. And I, um, I heard so many ridiculous things after my dad died and then after I was diagnosed with cancer. And then when I was working, I primarily worked with children um, down in Phoenix when I was doing grief work. And the things that people would say to kids would just, you know, it would make my head explode. And it was not, none of it was coming from a place of malice. It's just people didn't know how to talk about it and they didn't know what to say. And, you know, if, if my friend is going through a, a traumatic grief experience and I wanna support that friend, I need to be able to sit with grief as well, which means I better have figured out how to sit with my own grief. Otherwise I'm gonna find a way to run away from that friend or deflect from that friend or make that friend's experience either be all about me. That's called narcissistic redirection. If, you know, like if, if you told me, you know, oh my gosh, my dad, my dad just died. And I'm like, hey, my dad died when I was 19. Let me tell you all about that story. <laughs> you know, that on the surface sounds like um, I'm trying to connect, but what it really does to the griever, cause it ain't about me, it's about the griever. What it really does to the griever is I've just taken their story. I've taken their moment and I've co-opted it and I've made it mine. Um, so one of the challenges when you do go through a grief experience is finding people who can walk it with you. Um, you know, we're, we're a pretty grief phobic culture. Um, and which is so interesting because it's, it, if there's any common experience we'll all have, it's this, um, you know, so, the, for the next few slides, what I've done is I've pulled out a couple of images from later in the book, and I wanted to show how um, a little bit how I was trying to illustrate the different challenges in the grieving process. Um, excuse me, I'm working on a guidebook for the for the book as well that will that would be like the second part. So when you're in the middle of the grieving experience, maybe you'll like this book, but two or three years later, when you you got some distance and you're starting to kind of think about how it's impacted you. Here's some activities, here's some art exercises, some journal exercises, some discussion things. You know, you're not necessarily ready to, to talk. There was no way I was gonna read when breath becomes air right after my diagnosis of cancer. I have, I have read that book now, it's an incredible book, but he dies at the end, <laughs> you know? And that was, that was not gonna be useful to me at that time. Uh, so this is um, Floppy Bunny and he's one of my favorites. Um, you can see his, uh, He's a he's a a pencil sketched bunny, so his borders are pretty porous. He doesn't have um, some of the solidity that some of the other animals have. Um, he's pretty overwhelmed. His eyes are huge. 
His mouth is, you know, really kind of tiny and contorted. Um, I used for his, the string for his balloon, um, this is a brush that looks like a film strip, you know, to kind of represent the, um, the tapes and the stories that we can play over and over in our heads. Um, and these can be positive stories. Sometimes people get stuck only remembering good moments over and over again. Sometimes people get stuck in a, you know, like uh, literally in a traumatic moment, like if they were in, you know, if they were in combat or a car accident or an assault or something like that. And that's the, the part that gets stuck. Um, so this bunny represents PTSD, complicated grief, obsession, yearning, resentment. Um, and many other things that I think that each individual could kind of apply to this, this poor little dude. Um, the, the balloon at the end of the film strip looks like a bomb. So, you know, that was, that was intentional. Um, his fuse is, he's ready to, you know, he's wound really tight. So the text um, says, can you help me? Said Floppy Bunny. I seem to have gotten stuck in my memories. Bunny went to go untangle the strip of defining moments, but death stopped her. They aren't yours to unravel. How do I help then, she asked. Floppy Bunny was so wrapped up in the past, she was afraid he would strangle himself. He kept watching the same scene over and over again. Ask him to tell you the story of that scene, said Death, and when he's done, just say thank you. That didn't seem like it would be enough to help Floppy Bunny. He was so tightly wound. You would be surprised, said Death. Telling important stories untangles many knots. Um, and so my intention here is not to say that, that we don't sometimes need things like EMDR, other kinds of psychological processes to help with, you know, with trauma responses. But um, if you distill all of those down, they're really about regaining control of your narrative and allowing those, um, those places where the record has skipped to finally move through. Um, this one was um, was inspired by COVID, actually, when it became really obvious that there was going to be a ridiculously poor federal response to um, to what was happening, and people were healthy one day and dead in three days, and funeral homes were becoming overwhelmed. Um, people were not able to gather together for memorial services. That's a really important part for for most people to be able to start to process the, the grieving journey. Um, and I just, you know, the thought of people dying alone, not being able to have their family with you, how it would feel if you couldn't be in the room with someone who was dying. I mean, all of that was kind of just floating around when I, when I came up with this illustration. <clears throat> so this one, excuse me, sudden loss, regret, unfinished business, you know, future losses, um, thing, which is and what that means is, you know, when someone's gone, you're not going to then have you know, that next anniversary together or that the, you know, the trip that you were planning to take, the things that you had planned for are not going to happen. In this case, this is a, um, you know, the monkey mourning his uh, child. And, um, you know, so these would be things, you know, graduations and first dates and, you know, all that kind of stuff that's just not going to happen. Those are all losses as well. It's never just one thing. It isn't just death or change. It's all of the repercussions, all of the secondary losses that that you know, ripple out from that. Moon Monkey sang a song as she looked to the night sky. There is so much I still wanna to say to you, beloved. We didn't even get to say goodbye. Bunny thought of her future and all the things she wouldn't be able to tell her daddy. She'd believed there would always be one more day. Her grief began to tug at its string and Bunny was sure she heard it rumbling. Was it alive? Did it have something to say? She thought she saw death smile, but it was so hard to tell what was happening underneath that hood. My sister's best friend's father died um, earlier last week from a, a bicycle accident. Um, he was hit by a car. And um, so that was obviously a, a very sudden loss. Um, and she texted me the other day and she said, I don't think the family, my friend doesn't get it yet, you know? Um, and uh, statistically sudden losses, you know, can take up to a year before they really make that journey from the intellectual knowing, like my friend, my sister's friend knows her father died, but what, moving it from your head to your heart is an incredibly long path. And the sudden loss um, takes away some of the, you know, some, there's some benefits to a, 
to knowing someone is dying in terms of the grieving process. You at least are not maybe taken as off guard as you are when someone is here one day and then they're, they're, they're completely gone the next day. Whatever argument you were in the middle of when they left the house is still going on. Whatever you know, uh, challenges were still in the relationship, you know, that's what unfinished business means. What, what was I in the process of doing? Now I can't complete that with that person because they're gone. And that work then falls on the griever to find a way to complete those relationships once the person has gone. Um, so it's kind of a platitude, but also there's a lot of truth in, you know, say, I love you when you walk out the door, say, I mean, you know, do your best to try to, with the relationships that matter, when you close out a communication, have it be as clean as you possibly can. This one, um, the robin and the egg, I was, I was thinking about how we can do everything in the world right and things still suck. <laughs> you know, things still can go south, um, taking all the right precautions, doing all the right medical treatments, doing all the right steps to get the house that you wanted or to get the job that you wanted, and still it doesn't work out. Um, so Robin sat staring at her bright blue egg it was so pretty and perfect. Death brushed its hand over the egg and Robin shivered. Bunny started to say something, but Robin's grief blew toward her and she backed away. My egg didn't hatch, said Robin, even though I did everything right. Bunny loved watching the new birds in the spring. Why would Death want a baby bird? Did you take her egg, asked Bunny. She was so angry. Death was too greedy. It couldn't just go around taking anything it wanted. I don't take, said Death, but I know it looks like that to you. What do you do then, asked Bunny. Death turned away, what I must. And so I thought also of things like miscarriages and stillbirths, um, which are, which still do fall under what we call disenfranchised, disenfranchised grief, which is grief that is not recognized as like necessarily a real grief by society as, as a whole. Um, if you've ever gone through a miscarriage or had a stillbirth, um, you likely heard some pretty horrible things said to you. Um, again, in a well-meaning context, but you know, um, it, you can do it all, and things can still not, you know, not work. The dreams you have, um, the the plans that you have, you know, COVID has been a real lesson in that. You know, this is something that's been now a chronic stressor for the whole world. Um, what we had hoped was going to be something acute, something with a clear start and clear endpoint, has turned into this never-ending, you know, space of of uncertainty and stress. The alligators are about the shadow, about complicated grief, um, unresolved grief, intergenerational trauma, that sort of thing. Bunny noticed two alligators. One stared into the swamp and another one reflected underneath him. One grief can release older griefs, said the alligator on the swamp's edge. When you meet an older one, it's best to say hello. Bunny did not want to say hello to anything from the dark, so she ran to her safe hiding place. Grief is cumulative, said alligator's reflection. His tail splashed the swamp and the griefs rippled orange and blue. It builds up inside if you don't express it when you feel it. He opened his mouth wide. You might think you've resolved something, but old sorrows can still surprise you in the dark. So that notion of grief is cumulative. What that means is that when we don't address a grief that occurs and as it occurs um, or allow that grief to be expressed, it, it's gonna hang around. And then life is gonna happen and the next thing is gonna happen. It's gonna layer on top, you know, kind of like that. Um, the example that really stuck with me from school around this was an infant. And if an infant is being raised in a home where it's, where it's safe and cared for, every time it has a feeling, it's gonna let you know. It's gonna cry, it has limited ability to tell you, so they all kind of sound the same, but it's gonna cry when it's hungry, it's gonna cry when it's sleepy, it's gonna make a, you know, you're gonna know, the, the child's gonna let you know, and then it's gonna pass. That need gets heard and witnessed, and it, settles and we get you know we get acculturated pretty quickly to not express things when they come up to be still to be quiet to anything from the incredibly toxic 
boys don't cry to I'll give you something to cry about to, you know, you're too emotional. You're, a, you know, basically your emotional reaction is upsetting me. Um, those, you know, those kind of things can be, you know, really harmful and make people continue to, you know, kind of hold their grief close. You have to feel safe to express your feelings. And when you don't feel like you're in a safe space, either at home or, you know, or work or even safe within your own body, you're not going to, it's not going to be, um, be, a, be a choice that you're going to make. Um, and this is not, I think all of us have unresolved grief. I mean, I've been working with grief consciously for a long time and there's plenty left, <laughs> you know, to work with. It's not like all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm so clear of grief. It's just, it's just about trying to be as present as you can in the moment of what you're feeling and allowing those feelings to come. And the pandemic has really offered <laughs> some opportunities, right? To look at, at that. I mean, I'll have days where, you know, I mean, the days are all the freaking same you know, and I'll have days where I can kind of get enthusiastic and like, all right, I'm going to do what I need to do. But really what I'm doing is two feet from where I sleep, which is 10 feet from where I eat, which is 10 feet from the shower, which is, you know, like it's all here. And, um, you know, so I'll cry or then I'll maniacally laugh or then I'll watch Netflix for three days. I have managed to watch almost the entire 17 seasons of Grey's Anatomy in the last two months. I'm that good <laughs> at finding something to, to do when I'm like, I can't, I need to go do something else. And I think, man, what if we had a pandemic without Netflix? And that sets me, you know, into a whole other, you know, kind of spiral around what it could be like. Um, so this is really just kind of about paying attention. You know, maybe you've experienced, um, something really little that sets you off. Like maybe, you know, maybe your, your clothes shrunk in the dryer or they didn't have the kind of soup that you wanted at the store or something. And it just really sets off a reaction that's, that's out of balance to the event. You know, it's, it's more than likely not about not having the soup or about the fact that your whites now turned pink. It's, you know, it's, it's something else that finally has the space to come up. Um, and so kind of the ultimate, um, hope for the book um, and for how I approach grief is just, can you meet it? Can you say hello to it? Can you walk with it? Um, and when you do, you know, do things to deflect away from it or to move away from it, you know, do you notice that? Not to be shameful about it, but do you, do you notice? I'm a hundred percent clear that I've watched way more Grey's Anatomy than a person should have watched in the last, you know, couple of months. But I also know that there are very few things I can do now that helped me relieve stress. Um, travel was one of the big things that helped me relieve stress and get out of myself and re-experience things. And, and traveling from the bedroom to the office is not quite the, the same, even with a really strong imagination. This one's from my mom and she knows that, so I'm not being mean. Um, this is kind of the everything's fine. Uh, whale. <laughs> so the whale is all stuffed with um, grief. Um, so some of the things this could be about denial, avoid using avoidance tactics to cope, deflection, magical thinking. Um, on her way to the sea, she passed whale on the shore. Her belly was filled with grief too. Oh my, said whale, I swallowed all my grief and beached myself. Now I can't breathe. Bunny noticed grief was stuck in a whale's a grief was stuck in whale's blowhole, but when she tried to free it, a riptide pulled Bunny deeper under. Um, for me, I found being able to make visual representations of different ways that grief is expressed made it almost engaging. You know, I mean, like these are pretty colors inside, and it's you know, it's not just such a such a heavy experience and if you think about all of the different griefs as being all of the moments that, you know, all of the, the, the things that you might've loved that have changed, the, the, the choices, all of the things that made you who you were. Um, so they've all got something to offer. This one falls squarely in the unhelpful things that people say to grievers. 
um, my spider in the dark. Bunny wanted to give up. She was exhausted and her grief was out of control, crying and yelping and tugging at its string. Death had left her. Grandmother Bunny had promised to help her, but she was gone too. She decided she would sit beneath a tree with her grief and wait it out. Her grief got tangled up in spider's web and it struggled to break free, woke spider up. Oh, bunny, spider said, as she gently separated the strands of her web so grief could escape. Time doesn't heal anything. Time simply passes. Until you acknowledge your wounds, they fester and grow. Bunny's grief sighed and bunny was confused. Didn't her grief want to be with her? She closed her eyes, but her grief leapt up and down. It sounds forming two words she had come to dread. Follow me. So the example from, again, from one of my trainings about this particular myth was if you went out to the parking lot and your car had a flat tire, would you just sit down next to it and wait for enough time to pass for the tire to reinflate? And that's kind of the, the folly of the, the time heals. Time just happens. And sure, you're gonna change, but it doesn't fix and it doesn't address what needs to be addressed. This was actually the last drawing that I did for the book. Um, and I had thought the book was done. And then you know how you get those of you who are writers or are artists of other, in other areas, you're like, I'm so done. And then there's a part of you in the back of your head that's like, no, you're not done, there's something else. And you don't quite have that piece. And so I got Mouse in a dream and, um, and I was like, oh my God, that's it. Because what I was hearing consistently throughout COVID were ways that people were minimizing their experiences or minimizing the experiences of others. Um, toxic positivity was running rampant. Um, so some of the things that, that people end up saying to grievers end up making the griever having to take care of the person who's supposed to be trying to help. Um, so here's kind of an example in the text. Mouse was so tiny, Bunny almost missed her. She was surrounded by the strangest grief trees. What happened to you, asked Bunny. Every time I tried to talk about my grief, my friends told me not to be sad, said Mouse. They said I should be grateful for what I have, but that makes me feel guilty because I am grateful, but I'm also sad. So I don't know what's okay to say. I walk on pins and needles around them and make myself as small as I can. So they'll still want to be near me. I don't want to be alone. Death shook its head. Bypassing a feeling is not a shortcut. Don't let anyone tell you you can only feel one thing at a time. You can be both sad and grateful. I see your grief, Bunny blurted out. Mouse, I see it. You do, said Mouse, I do. Mouse smiled and grew bigger and Bunny felt good inside. Somehow meeting Mouse's grief had brought them closer. Thank you, said Mouse, and a new joy touched Bunny's heart. So this is also kind of the crux of the, the story. It's where Bunny starts to be able to see a little bit outside of her own experience and see the, again, empathize with the suffering and struggles of others. Um, and also she's starting to see the power of just witnessing, which seems so not enough, but it's so powerful to be able to hear another person's story, recognize it, honor it, essentially say, thank you for trusting me with that experience. Not trying to get in and fix, have you eaten enough kale? Any of you who have, you know, that's like the cancer default response. Here's kale and okay, I ate kale before cancer. <laughs> so what you got, you know, to, to come, you know, from there. So the other thing that really struck me as I was reading articles and listening to people during COVID was somehow people feel like, or they're told that they can only feel one thing at once. And we never only feel one thing at once. And it's okay to admit that you're frustrated or sad or angry, and you can be that and also be grateful for things, have love in your life, have joy in your life. They, they're, not, they're not opposites. Um, you know, and I, I hear, I've had a really privileged experience of COVID. I've been able to remain employed. I've been able to work from home. My income hasn't suffered. I haven't gotten sick. Um, 
And I can definitely recognize the privilege in that and be grateful for that. And also I legit am over it. And it's okay to feel that too. And be able to you know, express that because otherwise I'm denying what I'm feeling, um, which is gonna make those feelings get a little angry you know, kind of later on. I don't have to dangle things in people's faces or be cruel about it, but, it's, but you know, having a space to be able to honestly express these conflicting feelings. Um, you know, everyone is struggling in some way with COVID, but we're all not struggling in the same way. And some people definitely um, have far worse uh, challenges than I have had. Um, but we're still swimming in the sea. You know, and so I'd like to be able to keep the conversation, you know, open around the, the griefs that people are seeing. So this is the last slide. Um, and this is toward the end of the book, which is, you know, I think my biggest hope of the book, which is how can you meet what's coming to you in the dark? Um, so these are bats. Um, I feel reasonably certain they look like bats. Um, Next, Bunny saw three bats hanging upside down. Their hearts glowed. When you enter a dark place, they said in unison, it is useful to make friends with the creatures who live there. How do I make friends with creatures so different from me? You need to find the ways you're the same, said bats. So that's also you know, about being able to communicate, recognizing that when you move through any kind of significant emotional experience, you will emerge on the other side, but you will not emerge on the other side as the person that you were before. You will emerge on the other side as someone new. Um, and I, I really wish I'd bookmarked the article. I read it a couple of weeks ago and I, I think it was in the New Yorker, um, but it was about how we need to, as Americans, grieve the life that we have lost and accept that the life that we had is not going to be the life that we're, you know, going to be moving into even post vaccine even but you know things are going to be different and you can hear it you can certainly hear in the way we've we've been speaking as a country um you know and i certainly caught myself doing it having the magical thinking moments of well once we get to x date it will be better if we can just get out of 2020 right if we can just get you know as if magically on january 1st 2021 whew, right it's all going to you know, and that's real part, common part of the grieving experience. Maybe like, like the illustration I showed you at the beginning, I still think maybe you're gonna come through the door. I still think maybe I can pick up the phone and call you. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to move into that real place of, of accepting what is instead of continuing to long for what used to be. And I think as a, as a country, that's our biggest current grief challenge at the macro level letting go of the life that we had prior to the pandemic and beginning to make space for what is coming afterwards and adjust our lives accordingly. Now that doesn't mean that there's not lots of other personal griefs going on in at the familial level and the local level, you know, connected to the pandemic, but at that big national level, we have to recognize that we're not moving back. We're moving into something new. Um, and so when people say things like, you know, aren't you over it? Or, you know, when are you gonna come back? Or when are you gonna do it? And you're like, you're not, you know, you're, you're going to emerge and you're gonna emerge, you know, in a lot of really amazing ways and with different strengths and feelings that you, you know, that you didn't know that you had, you know, kind of within you, but you're not gonna be who you were before. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's an important kind of awareness um, cause it's natural to want to keep reaching back for who you were before, you know, even when I, when I, um, was recovering from surgery, I did all of these things that were against medical advice. I went back to work too soon because I was going to be freaking fine. I was going to, you know, go back and I was going to take like the least amount of time possible before I went back to work. I had a trip planned to New York, um, which took place about five weeks after I was out of surgery. And there was no way I was not going to New York. That was like gonna be this, and I went, that was gonna be this victory lap of, of a trip. Um, and I went, and if you've ever been to New York, you know, New York is not a place 
I had colon cancer. New York is not a good place if you have to go to the bathroom every 15 seconds <laughs> and you have to find, you know, those, those places. And, but I went and honest to God, I would do it again. I would go again because it was one of those, but it was, it was one of those times where I was wanting so much to be the person that I used to be. And I didn't want to admit yet that I was a person who needed to slow down in some areas, at least for a little while, that I was a person. I made a freaking plan. I bought tickets, right? We had tickets to Broadway shows. We were seeing people, we were going. And, um, you know, I see that in our global response to COVID, in my own personal response to COVID. And I wanna just bring that to, to an awareness. After a while, the pushing has to soften and move into, you know, um, what shapes can I take to fit this new form that we're in? So I'm gonna stop the share. Um, and if any of you have any questions, if Susan has, um, gotten any if you want to unmute and ask me something if you want to um oh, i have a question yes ma'am hi lisa i don't know if this is part of your research are there cultures that you think do a better job with grief either because there's rituals rituals there's much stronger community support or even a physicality you know dancing or drumming do you think that that um you know because america has you know certain uh, is kind of a a different, you know, kind of uh, soldiering on mentality. I'm just curious if as part of your research, you looked at other cultures responses. I did look at other cultures responses. Um, and I do think that um, certainly the, the base, the, the Protestant American work ethic type of culture, you know, is yeah. extremely poor at grief. Yeah. Um, I, I, exceptionally. So, yeah. um, you know, there's, you know, there isn't, there isn't a single indigenous culture, but indigenous cultures are by and large much better. Um, cultures where ancestors are honored and recognized and encouraged to continue to be part of the lives of the living tend to do better with grief. Um, you know, we, or I guess America is, you know, is more of a, they're here and then they're dead and then they're dead and then they're gone. And then if you're talking to your dead person, there's something wrong with you and here's some meds. And there's a whole lot of places in the world where talking to your dead is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and so I really, you know, one of my, my quote missions around this is I wanna depathologize the idea of grief. Grief is not a pathology. Grief is the normal and natural response to a change of any kind. There are behaviors that could manifest as a result of grief that could turn into something that's problematic that needs to be you know, addressed. But the grieving experience is just an experience. Um, but it's so easy to, you know, here's a pill, here's a this, here's a, you know, um, we're, we're a culture that's pretty heavy duty into psychopharmacology. Um, and in, I'm, not, I'm not knocking meds at all. And, and then there's definitely uses for, for meds, but medicating a grief experience might not be the best choice at first, you know, because you want to be able to feel it. Sometimes you can't, sometimes it's too traumatic. Sometimes there's something or too, too violent or too sad. There are, you know, all kinds of reasons why it might not be the, the exact, you know, you, you need a little bit of help, you need a bridge. Um, but as much as we can be in relationship to our feelings, the, the more emotionally healthy, that we're going to be. Um, my my mother's family is um, Finnish, and when we did the um, 23 and Me thing, she was actually 100% Finnish, and like nobody's 100% anything. She's 100% Finnish, um, and if you don't know much about the culture of Finland, they are a very stoic people. <laughs> they are, you know, um, and that certainly has has played out, but. They have an ancient tradition of lamenters. Women carried the lament. And they, um, and there's some really great videos on YouTube. And I, I think I have one up on my grief forest site um, 
women who will come to a family that's grieving and wail. Like that's their role in the culture. Um, it's, it's old. Um, there's a group of people in Finland who are trying to bring this back. And so there's some restored um, tapes that are up on YouTube. There's some clinics that people can go to to kind of learn, relearn the ancient art of the lament. Um, but something like that, where, where that expression is, is okay. Um, I was raised Lutheran and they're a very quiet people um, that eat a lot of jello. And <laughs> you know, so being able to, or being in a, in a environment where someone might be grieving more outwardly, it's gonna tend to make me a little bit uncomfortable or certainly before I went through the training that I did because it wasn't what I was used to. I didn't know what to, to do with families who were more gregarious or who were more, you know, how, you know, some families can just like be at each other and then be totally fine. Not my family. Like if we were ever at each other, that would be it. We would be done forever, <laughs> you know? And then, and then some families, that's just the catharsis moment. So, um, so yeah, I, th I think America is uniquely bad at grief because we, we wanna pretend like we can always be happy, that happy is a permanent state, that happy is dependent on certain circumstances being in place um, and that, you know, that any sort of, even, they even classify emotions and this is, I have a beef with this in psychology as positive and negative emotions. Um, and, uh, you know, grief is not a negative emotion. Anger is not a negative emotion. Anger can serve you really well, right? Um, we have to label them for some bizarre reason, but they're just feelings, you know? And then kind of like what Mouse was saying, you know, I want to, I want my friends to stay around me. So how do I have to adjust my behavior? What do I have to hide about myself so that my friends will stay? And that's really hard for the griever because now the griever is contorting and isn't allowed to honestly express themselves because um, they want to be, they don't want to be alone. One of the neat things physiologically about the human stress response is it increases your oxytocin, which means that you're going to be primed to reach out for social support. It's like hardwired in the stress response. So we're looking for support. So if you can be that person to, to just sit with the griever, to listen, to not try to get in there and fix anything, you know, that's a really powerful um, space. Um, and I think there's also in our culture, a, a conflating of healing and fixing. Um, and I, I don't think those two things are, are the same. I think that, um, you know, we heal as we address our wounds, but those wounds leave marks. So, you know, throughout the book, there's not an animal who doesn't have some connection to their grief balloon, whether it's wrapped all around them, choking them, or it's become something that they're able to just walk with rather than be entangled um, with. Um, it's okay to have those scars and it's okay to be proud of those scars and to, to you know, wear them as, as the marks that made us. It was a very long answer. I'm starved for people, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, Nancy. I can't unmute. Is it okay to share a story on my end? Of course. Um, I had breast cancer within the last couple of years and I did very much what, you, like you suggested, although I didn't stay away from books. <laughs> but I found a lot of healing practice. And, and one thing I did was to invite the cancer in for tea, for tea. And I set the cancer down and I said, why are you here? And what do you want to teach me? And it was amazing. It may sound absurd, but it, it was amazing because I'm still learning from it. I'm yeah. fine now. I'm in good shape. But good. I'm grateful, but I'm still learning from that process. Yeah. Never be the same. So no, it'll never be the same. And, and that, and we can use those questions. Those are really powerful questions. Um, you know, what do you need? How can I help? You know, why are, you know, what do you have to offer me? What do you have to 
share with me. And that's a, and how do a I very away in the way of talking to cancer? When can you leave? Can you call <laughs> <me>? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say the thank you for this wonderful presentation. So thanks, Nancy. It's good to see you again. There's a lot of wonderful comments and okay. websites just um, of, of books or articles from the New Yorker. Uh, but some of the things about uh, in America, and this is from Kim, it almost seems like dying is some kind of failure. Well, I think the, one of the things that really surprised me when I was going through my internship was, um, and I think it's somewhat better now, but you could go through the training to become a medical doctor and not have taken any classes in death and dying and the grief response. And how do you work with people in a hospital setting and not think you're gonna be involved with death? Um, you know, the, uh, the, I think you're, I think that comment is, is exactly, you know, correct that doctors, many doctors will, will view death as failing. You know, it's not as opposed to it being, you know, it's, it's as natural as birthing and, um, you know, I certainly want my doctors to do everything they possibly can to help me if there's things that can be done to help me. But I also want them to have the wisdom to know when it's time for me to move to the next space, you know, because um, um, dying isn't failing, you know, that's, that's, but I think that is pervasive. And I see Lisa put a comment in about um, the battle language around cancer. And that was, that was something that I, I consciously worked at either ignoring when I heard it because people came at that all the time. Um, I want you to kick cancer's ass. I want you to do this. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Um, I want very much to not die from it, but I feel like if I go to war against my own body, I'm setting myself up um, for a really tragic ending. Um, and I, you know, I, I took steps. I did, you know, I didn't just sit beside my car with my flat tire and said, I'm just going to will this, you know, thing, thing to, to go away. But, um, but I think language is super important. And if I viewed the tumor and the experience as the enemy to be annihilated, that enemy was inside of me. And um, I didn't see how that could be good psychologically for me. Um, that that when we've seen how well the war on drugs has worked, like the war on stuff doesn't work. <laughs> you know, what if, what if, you know, kind of what, what Nancy was suggesting that, and that's a softer practice. What if we inquired into the experience? What if we looked at the experience through a lens of curiosity rather than through a lens of, um, of uh, aggression, you know? Um, it's terrifying enough to think that something had gone wrong inside your own body that you didn't even know, you know, until you know. It's like it had to have been in me, it had to have been happening for a few years before I knew. So, okay, that's disconcerting. Um, and then, you know, what, what, <clears throat> what are the best tools to fall more in love? And so, that I actually, the first drawing I made right after diagnosis was on an orange background and it was a witch, all black with a little lamp and her cat, right? Kind of like going into the underworld, basically. It's like, I'm gonna use this experience to go deeper. I wanna use this experience as much as I can to love myself more, to love my body more, to love being alive more. And I'm not saying I didn't have days when I was pissed off as hell or that I was frustrated. And, you know, I'm not saying that at all, but, but I kept going to return to how can I love and how can I accept this more? Um, the, there are some more comments that I think I'd like to read. I think sure. Uh, one was from Lisa about the whole, there's a whole language around cancer mm -hmm. being a battle and the person having lost the battle, if they die. Um, a lot of people really, uh, think the day of the dead is a very healthy response. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And uh, someone wants to know if these resources will be available, the chat, all the, the uh, websites that people have posted with books and articles. And you can save them on your own computer, can't you? 
Yeah, I, if you want the, the chat won't save to the video recording. So if you want some of these links that are put up, you can go Thank ahead you. and you can copy them with your cursor. You can like, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can paste it in, in a window in your own, um, your own screen. And uh, someone wants, to, you know, just commented about, you can go through a whole mental health counseling program and not have any training in death and dying. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one that you should know about is um, yeah. Rochelle thanking you for this lovely supporting and warming presentation discussion. And, uh, and so does uh, Kim or say, so you better save those wonderful comments. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, think, I think there's a way to save it. There's a way there's I, a, save it. I know yeah. I can't embed it in the YouTube video that I give you though. There's something um, called the file down Yeah, I there. see the file button. That's mm -hmm. how you yeah. do it. That is how you do it. I'll try. If I, if I'll I try. could make a comment. Hi hey there. Who's, who's that? Hi Lorraine. It's Lynn Marie. Oh, Lynn Marie, hi. Hi. Um, oh, and I'm supposed to tell you, Michelle woke up ill this morning, so she oh, no. couldn't join us, was very okay. disappointed. Sure. But I did tell her that the session was being recorded. So It is if I did everything right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I didn't, <laughs> it says what it's recording. I'm looking at it. It's flashing. It looks right to, to me. What I wanted to um, touch on was how powerful it was for me. This is in regard to COVID to see finally a national response for, I believe it was the night preceding the inauguration. And I got to watch that and weep from my core and that was something that I hadn't done because my my deflecting dark humor which is a coping uh -huh. skill I sure. use sure was always well it's very uncomfortable to be in a nation where the president wants me dead just because yeah, of how old yeah. I am right. or uh, you know um and and so I would deflect and deflect but when I saw those pillars of light mm -hmm. at that reflecting pool and I saw us honor what was at the time 400,000 deaths mm -hmm. I thought Finally, finally, a moment of national yeah. mourning, of actively saying, we are beyond saddened that you are no longer with us. And allow the mixture of anger and grief and tears, all of it, messy, very messy it was for me to just be yeah, and to and grasp Hubert my Love hands Lynn. over my heart and say, thank you. And we're it, sorry. Yeah. Do you it know, was a, it was that a, meant everything moment. to me. Mm -hmm. and I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, I think many, many Americans felt that, you know, maybe along with even the, the awareness that, oh my God, we haven't even had that. Like there's just been such a long, long, trauma response to that past administration that to to then think wait we haven't even oh my god how have we not <laughs> how have how has no one cared enough to you know to, to offer this and i and i know for me that's when i first thought maybe i'm gonna break now like in a good way like i can maybe i'm maybe into, you know, like i said at the beginning about an infant being safe being allowed to feel when it's safe it's like maybe there's a moment now when it's okay for me to allow all of the feelings from the last four years and the feelings around COVID to start to move because there's a recognition that there's something to move. There's a recognition that something matters. And that was such an important act that President Biden did. That was, that was, you know, he couldn't fix it either. 
but that presence and that ability to, to um, and, and he's a man who's known grief. And I think that that has provided a unique lens for him on this. Um, I, um, anyway, yes, you're, yes, it was incredibly moving. Anybody else? I have a question on that note. Yes, ma'am. Um, so can you please talk about some ways to help our grief in wherever we are at, you know, to like help express it and to move through us? Like, so it sounds like ritual is very important um, and self-expression is very important, but can you talk about just some ways to help cooperate with grief and the process that it wants you to go on? I think that the first step for that is to um, meet it, to introduce yourself to it. Um, and that might sound a little woo-woo-y, you know, you, it works. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> She's like, no, <laughs> it, um, it's, it's a Jungian approach to working with, um, working with the psyche. And it's a, it's an approach that I really resonate with. Um, you can, you know, draw that grief, you can name it, you can dance it, you can, you know, whatever, whatever expressive art feels you know, kind of authentic for you. And then it's about dialogue. Um, and, and those questions like the ones Nancy brought up um, are, are really great questions because they're open-ended, you know, um, in, it's my foundation about how to approach writing. It's the same way writing as a relationship. Um, you know, so you, you, you rise up, you meet your, the source of your writing or the source of your art. You can do the same thing with the emotions that you want to work with. Um, and engage with them as equals, not as something that has to be banished, not as something that has to be crushed. There's a, um, I'm going to botch it because I always do on the spot, but there's a verse from the, from the Tao, when the guest comes, make hot tea, when the guest leaves, throw it out. And that's referring to emotions. So when anger comes, let it in, let it move through you. I don't mean go destroy other people, but you know, let it express the, <laughs> I feel like I have to qualify that all the time, you know, <laughs> let it, let it move through you when, when it, when it emerges and when it's done, it will go on its own. You don't have to have an exorcism, you know, for emotions to go back to that baby. I'm hungry. I'm going to cry. I'm, I got fed. Okay. Now I don't need to cry anymore. Um, so it's a place of love and respect for all of the things that you're experiencing. Um, things won't stay when their usefulness is gone unless we hold on to them. And that's a particular challenge of mine. I'm like an uber attached per I'm gonna that's one of my struggles is wanting to hang on too tight to stuff that I should let go of that have that has already, you know, kind of kind of passed. The image that we or the the exercise we did in one of my trainings around that was was kind of holding hands. So the facilitator was Reckon, was um, like representing maybe uh, someone you were angry with or ex any something that you, you know, and you would hold their hand, but they weren't actually holding your hand. You just were, you know, and then it would, and they would just stood there. So you could stand like for 15 minutes in front of the whole class. And finally, you know, they'd go, well, I'm not holding on. What are you doing? You know, and then you're like, ah, it was, you know, like it was me that was holding on to the thing, the thing was not holding on to me at all. It was me. And so complicated grief, one of the ways complicated grief manifests is holding on to that grief. And I definitely went through complicated mourning for my dad. Um, I didn't want him to be dead. Like that was the underlying, like, and I was afraid that if I let that move through, um, I would lose him, you know, and I, I didn't, you know, I mean, Bunny's journey is not directly mine, but it's got a, certainly a lot of similarities to some of the things that she was, that she experiences. Um, and I was so afraid if I didn't remember him in some way every day that I didn't love him enough or that I didn't, you know, and when the first time that, you know, I forgot on his death day, which was probably five or six years after he died, the day came and went and I forgot, you know, and then I felt so horrible for, I, mean, I didn't forget he died, <laughs> you know, but I had, I had made, you know, such a, you know, it was kind of untangling that, that attachment. 
but it's all about love. You know, it's all about love. Anybody else? May I quickly, I, I'm not able to save the chat anywhere. So maybe somebody could tell me a private message or I, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Um, do you see the file button underneath the chat? But nothing, it tells me um, a place, but then I go to that place and there's nothing to save, so. Um, if you just click like Dropbox, it should go straight to Dropbox. Oh, cool, all right. I think, I don't know. That's what I tried to do. Okay. To respond um, around COVID, as you sure. were some mm -hmm. of the people have, some of them are mine, which is positive thinking. And I wanted to explain why. I got, I guess I'll say tired of, you know, I'm an artist in my personal life and email after email from artists, as everybody knows, this was such a terrible year and we just hope next year is gonna be better. And it, it's like, it became like contagious. Even my meditation group, I said, it starts every night like the nightly news, you know, blah, 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 <laughs> negative, negative, negative. I'm like, I understand COVID is bad, but what if next year your house burns down? You're, you get cancer, you, um, you know, uh, whatever. It's like, I think what annoyed me about it, to be honest, is just this, lack of uh, people's capacity to understand that life has challenges, to have some gratitude for something. Mm -hmm. First, because that's been such a journey for me and I feel like such a minority everywhere I go because it's just all negative people and wanting everyone to be part of group think. Okay, everybody right in this year stink. Um, and I got sick of it. I unsubscribed from newsletters. I quit my meditation group. And I wanted to, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm so grateful that I'm alive. It's a miracle to be alive. Yep. Our bodies are so complex. Everything else from there is like gravy. <laughs> I acknowledge I got really, you know, sick of listening to people. And I'm very fortunate. I have a, a farm and I have three horses and a beautiful barn. And I couldn't have had a better COVID experience because mm -hmm. of COVID. COVID isn't really any different than me than pre-COVID was, which is to take time, to be grateful every day, yeah. to do what I love to do in life, to, and I've had suffering that I wouldn't wish on anyone. As I said, if I ever wrote my autobiography, Oprah would be signing me up for her show. I really <laughs> have had a lot of suffering. And I understand, you know, people are in different phases of that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but there's only so much I could listen to. Sure, sure. Say, yeah. you know, um, I, I was... Somebody who, you know, some of the people you were kind of saying, I was that person and I have, I make no apologies for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. Thanks. And I even told people at work, you can walk Fox News till midnight, but you don't get, <laughs> don't get to call me the next day in a panic. I said, take this time to look at how do your ancestors to do fear and grief, right? Because mm -hmm. that's going to tell you something about your response. Take this time to work on comorbidities. No one said you don't have to exercise. No one said you don't have to eat right. This is a wonderful opportunity to shore up your health, to reduce the likelihood. And I just told people, I'm the captain of the ship at this company and I can't sail it if you guys are gonna call every day in a panic attack because literally people have TVs in their bedroom and Fox News is Sure, on. sure, yeah. yeah. So um, I set those boundaries and that helped too. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone yeah. else? And I think we're coming on to 3.30. So let's see, we did have one new message. May I, while, while Susan looks at that, do you mind if I just, um, Lorraine, I just want to one, thank you for this amazing presentation. It's been- Thanks, fantastic. Rick. Yeah. Uh, and then you. I would encourage everybody, if you've not had a chance to just really spend a lot of time with Lorraine's book, I, I have, I've, I've actually read it several times and the smallest details of, of her drawings, we have to stop getting her to say that she's not an illustrator because yes. <laughs> they are fantastic and they mean so much. Like she's put so much work into it. So I really encourage not to just skim over the, the beautiful pictures because they're little tiny details that they, and each have a meaning. And um. So, so thank you for sharing that um, art, your words and your, and your illustrations um, with the world. Thanks, Rick. Thank you.
I've known Rick since I was born. <laughs> <laughs> say, it was great. I had my camera off. I'm, I will just say, because I did not think that I could hear you talk about your dad. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah. so I spent I spent a while um, not off, and I think that was a good idea. But thank you. Was... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I met you a couple of years ago. I decided I wanted to meet you, so I walked into your workshop. I wasn't signed up for it, and I introduced myself, and we had a lovely conversation. And you forever stayed on my radar screen. Thank you, know? you Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, I followed you. It was quite a few years ago. Thank you. I actually remember. Yeah. Yeah, it was profound. We just, something from you passed to me and sparked me. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. This work just feels really important to me. I, I appreciate you taking the time. I know everybody is Zoom fatigued in some way or another, and there's always, you know, it's it's a lot. And um, and I'm really grateful to be able to, to talk about this with people. And many of you are from outside of Arizona. So that couldn't happen if um, without Zoom. So that's, that's a gift of it. And that's a thing to be grateful for. So um, yeah, and thanks to Peregrine Books for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Lorraine. It was wonderful. And we all want more, but I guess we, we have to, <laughs> <laughs> we have to wait. Maybe, well, one thing we should ask you is um, a speculative memoir with Ravens. Uh, Give us a little information about that before you go. Yeah, I have a memoir coming out in October um, called A Constellation of Ghosts, A Speculative Memoir with Ravens. Um, it's coming out from Regal House. And um, the tagline for that is, um, I was busy doing other things when cancer came and my father, 30 years dead, returned to me as a raven. And so mm -hmm. the book has two different formats within it. One of them is, um, is a lyric, uh, kind of lyric essay pieces. And then the other part is a stage play, which is a dialogue between me, Raven, Raven's father and Raven's mother. And so that's working out intergenerational trauma, family stuff in kind of that other world. The lyric essays piece is the, this actually really did happen. My dad didn't actually show up in the backyard with the Raven, but the, the things, or maybe he did, but the things that, um, that I express in that part are also all things that our family went through and that I you know, have, I'm kind of turning a, a lens on. So um, I did see they just put it up for pre-order um, with just the ebook version right now, but there will be a print version. Um, and so I will definitely be letting everyone know that, that it's mm -hmm. coming. I'm, um, I'm really excited about that book. It's the, it's, it's a grief mm -hmm. book, but it's, it's an everything is fine book too. But it's also about <laughs> it's also about love, and it's it's about you know um, how our stories shape us, and and you know it's not a sad, depressing cancer story. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so Lynn Roy says, "Don't close out the chat; she's saving it." Okay, yeah, Susan and I'll hang out for a second, so um, yeah. to make sure you can get what you need. Thank you to everybody for coming out. Thank you, Bonnie, Michelle, Christina, Jean, Kim, Nancy, Lisa, Anne, Rick, Vicki, Benna. Yay. So lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks. Bye bye. 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 That was so great. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Susan. So good to see you. So good to see you, too. I'll see you soon, okay? <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Did you get it, Limerie? You think? Okay. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I know this works because I have done it before, but for some reason. It seems to be. I have never done it before, and I did try. I have to done see if it. It went where I thought it was going to go. And when I tried what you had suggested, mm -hmm. which seemed like, wow, that's really hip slick and cool. Let me do that. Right. Yeah, I cannot. Okay. I, you know, I selected it all 
And then I asked to copy it, which seems like it would make sense, right? It does. Uh-huh. And then I went into file and I just chose Dropbox. Mm -hmm. And, oh God, it wants me to sign into my Dropbox. Well, that's easy enough. Okay, so I'm doing that. 